On November 8, 2006, NVIDIA launched their Earth-Shattering 8800 series, bringing to the table monster performance and compliance with Microsoft's new DirectX 10 API by using a unified shader architecture. Needless to say, their flagship 8800 GTX quickly overtook any other consumer graphics solution on the market with its unmatched performance and feature set, undoubtedly cementing NVIDIA's position as the new leader in graphics before the end of 2006. For ATI's part, they seem to have a lot on their plate at this time, having undergone an acquisition by AMD and now working out all the kinks in their troublesome R600 silicon. Finally, in May of 2007, six months since NVIDIA's G80 launch and after a long time struggling to get R600 out the door, ATI had finally released their much-anticipated Radeon HD 2900 XT. The ambitious card sought to bring a lot to the table in the GPU world, but unfortunately for ATI, the aspiring high-end card wasn't able to measure up with NVIDIA's monster 8800 GTX and even struggled against the step-down GTS. In the end, the HD 2900 XT didn't make as much of a splash as ATI had hoped and remains one of their most forgotten and ill-regarded releases. Today we're going to have a bit of a deep dive on this aspiring high end of yesteryear and seeing if this legend deserves its reputation or was given the short end of the stick all those years ago. The 2900 XT makes use of the massive 720 million transistor R600 GPU, which comes equipped with 320 stream processors and is clocked at 743 MHz. One of the card's strong suits is easily VRAM, with 512MB of GDDR3 running on a groundbreaking 512-bit memory interface. As a result, the card had an unheard of 106GB per second of memory bandwidth, putting it well above its competition on that front. One major area where the card stumbled, though, was power consumption. Its TDP comes in at a juicy 215 watts and requires one 8-pin and one 6-pin peg connector for power. Now just because the 2900 XT fell short of its competition in numerous areas doesn't mean that it wasn't a technological wonder. It was the first ATI card to make use of a unified shader architecture, which gave it a huge performance uplift over its predecessor as well as support for DirectX 10. We also have that innovative 512-bit memory bus, which had never been seen before on a consumer card until then and even in the future few cards would boast such a wide bus. In addition, R600 had a dedicated hardware engine for tessellation, which was very similar to the tessellation hardware found in the Xbox 360 Xenos GPU that ATI had previously worked on. This allowed for some very impressive rendering quality at the time with little to no performance hit. An example of this can be seen in ATI's Ruby Whiteout tech demo, with all of the mountainous terrain being tessellated for a much higher level of detail than previously attainable. It's definitely impressive to see that ATI put some stock into forward-looking hardware features like this, but unfortunately this tessellation engine had no DirectX support at the time, which meant it required special steps in order to be utilized. And since it didn't make much sense for developers to spend extra time on a feature that only a subset of users would be able to experience, tessellation was seldom used in a majority of applications for the 2900 XT. With all this cutting edge tech, it's definitely fair to say that R600 was a huge undertaking for ATI, and they really managed to pack a lot of impressive stuff in their first DirectX 10 GPU. But of course, we have to talk about the downsides as the car is quite a few. Aside from the very high power consumption, it had several faults on the performance side as well. One major one was the card's weak texturing power, which could be owed to R600 having only 16 texture units compared to 32 in Nvidia's G80. To add on to this, R600 had the questionable method of forcing AA Resolve to run on the shader hardware instead of the ROPS, which would rob the card of both pixel throughput and shading power whenever anti-aliasing was enabled. On the other hand, G80 had no such limitation and would only take a minor performance hit with AA. There were a couple more faults that were preventing R600 from reaching greatness, but we'll discuss more on those later in the video. All in all, the 2900 XT was a fairly balanced package of upsides and downsides, but next we have to talk about its price. ATI's high end would debut at $399 USD, which was pretty hard to stomach given Nvidia's 8800 GTS 640MB was already getting a lot cheaper and wasn't much slower than the Monster GTX. So how is the legacy of the 2900 XT? Unfortunately, over a decade and a half later, it remains relatively forgotten about by a lot of people, and I can't imagine why. On a serious note, as someone who loves legacy hardware, it's clear to see that the 2900 XT doesn't get much attention these days, even though it remains one of ATI's most important releases. Another YouTuber and massive inspiration of mine, Budget Builds Official, also felt the same and wanted to include some of his thoughts on this legend. It's been a while since I got to talk about the AMD Radeon 2900 XT, 
So as soon as I got the opportunity to talk about one of my favourite graphics cards again, I very literally leaped at it. I'm sure you all know the basics on the specs and it being AMD's first DirectX 10 flagship and all that, and it certainly had some big shoes to fill, and is often forgotten about due to Nvidia's frankly phenomenal 8800 GT cards. But to those that use it today, it certainly does have a lot of features going for it, and I think one of the main appeals of this card isn't so much the pioneering DirectX 10 technology that got overshadowed, but the absolute powerhouse this card is when it comes to DirectX 9 titles, having none of the issues that are associated with Nvidia cards of the era, and pretty good support for older titles. You can max out plenty of those classic titles in high resolutions at nearly always a full 60fps. And, you know, being able to do that with some frankly brilliant flame decals down the side of your card, well, that's never going to fail to appeal. Couldn't agree with you more there, budget builds. Those flames are the hotness. Oh, and don't forget about the extra FPS boost that comes with them, too. Anyway, I think it's now time to see what this underdog can do. It's hard to tell the true performance story of the 2900 XT without also including some of its green competition, so today we're pitting it against its old rival, the aforementioned GTS 640. Now keep in mind this isn't any old GTS 640, but actually an overclocked Core 112 model. To keep things more fair though, I'll be downclocking it to standard GTS 640 speeds for the testing. Even then, the card still has the extra 16 CUDA cores over the base model, so the 2900 XT definitely has its work cut out for it. I'll be running these beasts in the usual test system, which has an overclocked 3770K on a Gigabyte Z77X UD5H motherboard, along with 16GB of DDR3 at 1600MHz. While not an age-appropriate test bed, it'll definitely allow these cards to perform at their best. Now I did opt to use the older Catalyst 11.2 drivers on the XT for better performance in the older games. And yes, I did test out the latest driver set in the newer games and saw zero performance improvement, so you'll be seeing the best performance all around with these drivers. Now you'll notice I did turn down the textures in some of these tests, and this was to ensure I would not hit a VRAM limit on the 2900 XT. Also, to get my numbers, each benchmark was completed three times and then averaged. With all of that being said, let's now dig into some testing. First game up is Fear. Here I'm using the built-in benchmark and shot pretty high with the options, choosing 1080p with the max settings and 4x FSAA. Surprisingly, the card stayed neck and neck in the benchmark, with both producing 60 frames per second on average. Now, I did rank the GTS higher here as it has slightly better frame times as seen in the 0.1% lows. It's not a bad showing for both cards, and has the XT off to a pretty good start. Considering how demanding this game was back in the day, it's nice to see the Radeon powering through it this well. Next up is another notorious system killer with Crisis, and here I'm using the built-in benchmark to obtain my results. I went for 720p along with the high preset and no AA, setting texture quality to medium to keep VRAM usage in check. Once again, we see the two beasts put down the same average frame rate, with 38 frames per second on both cards. Frame times did suffer a bit on the Radeon though, which can be seen once again in the 0.1% lows. Looking at the frame time graphs, we can see the 2900 XT exhibits a lot more swings, which made gameplay a little jittery, but it was nothing too bad. The game was another nice showing for the pair as the 2900 XT held its own really well against the choice GTX 640. Far Cry 2 is the next game up, and here I'm using the built-in benchmark with a very high preset, texture set to medium, and 4x AA at 720p. The 8800 GTS is doing pretty good with these settings, averaging 52 frames per second. The 2900 XT did not perform well here at all. A lot of this poor performance can be attributed to the use of 4x AA, and I'll discuss a bit more on this later in the video. The card only mustered 37 frames per second here, giving the 8800 a staggering 40% lead. Frame times were pretty poor on both cards as shown in the 0.1% lows, but they were noticeably worse on the XT as the run was riddled with harsh swings, which is reflected in the 1% lows. Overall, this game bodes a lot better for the 8800 GTS, and it's pretty evident that AA is poking at the Radeon's weaknesses. Next up, we have Stalker Call of Pripyat, and I use a standalone benchmarking tool to get our numbers. I went for some pretty steep settings here, choosing 1080p with the medium preset and enhanced full dynamic lighting in DX10 mode. Looking at the charts, uh, it's definitely not a good showing for the 2900 XT, as its rival pulls ahead by 29%. It's not as much of a beatdown as Far Cry 2, but still, doesn't exactly inspire confidence for the Radeon. 
As to be expected for the X-Ray engine, frame times weren't anything to write home about on both cards, but the swings were felt a lot harsher on the XT, and this reflects in the poor 1 and 0.1% lows. Also, I tried dropping the resolution to 720p on both cards, but the XT still fell far behind and continued to see poor frame times. I wish I had better news to report for the Radeon, but unfortunately it wasn't able to touch the GTS here. GTA 5 is up next and I obtained my results using the last section of the built-in benchmark as it's the longest and most demanding part. I went for some modest settings this time around with 720p and the normal options as well as 4x AF, as this game is pretty much a slideshow on these cards with anything higher. The 2900 XT has been struggling to secure convincing win thus far, but here it walked the GTS like it was no big deal, leading by 7%. Now frame times weren't great on both cards, but the 2900 XT exhibited more swings, as shown in the 1% lows. Older Terrascale cards are notorious for performing poorly in this game due to a lack of driver support, so I'm not sure if the XT is just doing really well here or if the GTS is dropping the ball. Either way, it's a win for the Radeon. Next game up is the 2013 version of Tomb Raider, and using the built-in benchmark along with 720p and the normal preset with FXAA, the 8800 GTS put down the hammer once again, beating down the Radeon by 19%. The 2900 XT held up okay-ish, but saw noticeably worse frame times than its rival. Taking a look at the frame time graphs, we can see the Radeon exhibited numerous large stutters at the beginning, middle, and end of the benchmark, and these were repeatable every single run. Overall, it's a nice showing for the GeForce, but the XT didn't do as well as I was hoping here. And the last game up is Shift 2 Unleashed, and for the capture I did a quick race during dusk. Settings wise I went for 1080p with the medium settings as well as low textures and no AA. Here the cards were pretty closely matched but the 8800 GTS is still pulling ahead by 11%. Frame times were equally poor on both cards as they saw a lot of micro stuttering during each of my runs. I was glad to see the 2900 XT holding its own against the GTS but both cards definitely struggled a bit in this game. So adding up the results and averaging them out. We can see the 8800 GTS is the victor of this roundup, enjoying a 12% overall lead over the XT. Digging into the results a bit deeper though, the Radeon falls noticeably short in the frame times department with there being about a 24% deficit and 0.1% lows. I was expecting the XT to stumble a bit with the frame times, but not by this much. It's definitely an interesting result. Had I tested a standard 96 SP8800 GTS, I would speculate the XT would be leading in averages but still falling short in the frame times but probably not by this margin. To bring the testing to a close, I measured total system power draw on both of the cards using Tomb Raider's built-in benchmark, and unsurprisingly, the GTS is pretty light on power with the system consuming 212 watts. Switching to the XT, we saw an 18% jump to 250 watts, definitely a good bit more, but still less of a jump than I was expecting, as the XT is well known to love the juice. Also, as a side note, these numbers were taken directly from the wall and PSU efficiency is not factored in. As this video concludes, a couple of questions come to mind. First, why does R600 struggle to keep pace with Nvidia's G80? There's a few reasons for this, but to start, R600 is very shader bound in a lot of scenarios. R600 had 64 blocks of 5-way shader units, which they listed as 320 stream processors. While each block of SPs could run up to 5 scalar instructions per thread in parallel, those instructions have to be independent from each other. This would put a lot of stress on ATI's compiler to extract parallel operations from shader code, which wasn't always possible. As a result, this could cause poor utilization within each SP block, thus causing some performance inefficiencies in some cases. In contrast, NVIDIA's G80 with its SIMT design had no such limitation and was free to process instructions across individual threads. Moreover, like I previously mentioned, R600 forces AA to run on the shader hardware, which chews away at precious shader performance and pixel throughput. To provide an example of how limiting this can be, 
Look at what happens when I disable 4xAA and Far Cry 2. Yeah, that's a pretty sizable performance improvement. To be fair, ATI would address this issue later on with the HD 4000 series, which saw the ROPS reworked for hardware AA resolve. Before we get too technical, let's address the second and probably most important question. Was ATI's 2900 XT competitive with Nvidia's offerings? Well, it kinda depends on who you ask. Many thought that the 2900 XT was the contender for the 8800 GTX's crown, but its launch price of 399 USD tells a much different story. It was more trying to compete with the aforementioned GTS 640, which also launched at a similar price of 449 USD. However, by the time the 2900 XT came out, the GTS 640 had fallen well below 400 USD, which kind of put the Radeon in an odd position, as it was now expected to exceed the GTS 640 in performance, which it could manage in some instances but not in others, as shown here. While the 2900 XT offered a lot for a car at its price point, I really don't blame anyone for going for the 8800 GTS at the time. I mean it performs around the same or better, consumes less power, and wouldn't take significant performance hits with anti-aliasing enabled. That leads us to the final question. If the 2900 XT wasn't the contender for the crown, where was the flagship of the HD 2000 series? Well, it was the 2900 XTX that promised to deliver leading performance, but that vision would never come to fruition as for numerous reasons the card was canned and never released. If you want to learn more about that failed flagship, I highly recommend you check out F2F Tech's review on it, link in the description. It's a really interesting story and his masterfully crafted video does it justice. As for some of my personal thoughts on this card, it's definitely one of my favorite graphics cards of all time and to me it remains one of ATI's most interesting releases as well. Looking back, it was a very innovative card considering all the impressive tech they managed to include in R600 and it's a shame that it was so badly overshadowed by Nvidia's offerings at the time. Before I end the video, I wanted to give a massive thanks to Budget Builds Official for taking the time out of his busy schedule to make his segment for the video. It was amazing of him to do that and it's awesome to see some of his thoughts on this legend, so thank you very very much. Even though it was a lot of work, I loved making this review on one of my favorite video cards of all time. I will say, I'm definitely not done testing the HD 2900 XT, and in the future I will compare it against some newer 320 SP Terascale cards, as well as some more Tesla stuff from Nvidia. For now though, that'll be the end of this video. If you got this far, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.